Uh, welcome to Tech Tuesday. My name is Tom Levine, and I am Cornerstone's technical specialist. Uh, I also work in our commissions department, so uh, I'm here to answer any and all technical questions today, but uh, I have other roles as well. Uh, today, I'm going to be describing how to use a modern computer, and I do have a few disclaimers before I jump into this. Uh, first off, we're going to be doing this in Windows 10. Um, I know that some of you may have heard, but there is a new operating system out there by Windows right now, uh, Windows 11. Uh, we'll actually be covering that in a later webinar, uh, so stay tuned for that. But uh, for now, we're going to do this in Windows 10. You don't have to be following along in Windows 10, though. Uh, a lot of these sort of commonalities that I'm going to be covering today are applicable on not just PC, but also Mac, uh, Linux, whatever operating system you use. Uh, we're going to be going through a lot of more best practice type things today and just general computer well-being. So don't worry if you're on a different operating system. We'll be covering kind of the similarities between some of them. Uh, that being said, some housekeeping before we really get into everything. Uh, first, if you have a question, please feel free to type in the questions box. I know we already had one question, so I will be circling back around to you, I promise. Um, other than that, you can also put it in the chat box. I monitor it throughout our presentation. Uh, if you bring up something that I think is relevant to what we're discussing at the moment, I will answer it then. If not, I'll circle back around to it at the very end of our presentation, and you'll know that I'll answer all your questions. Um, also, if you want to just reach out to me directly or don't feel comfortable asking a question on this webinar, uh, please feel free to just email me. My email's on the screen there at tlevine at crnstone.com, and my direct line is 513-487-5390. Uh, also, uh, I'll be putting this up at the end of our presentation, so don't feel like you have to write down all of this information now. Uh, two more final notes. Uh, first, you can earn up to $7,000 with Cornerstone's Cash Incentive Program. Uh, we're doing it a little bit differently this year, so you'll want to call your broker advisor to learn some more details. But uh, for new group and individual business sold between January 1st and December 31st of uh, this year, 2022, uh, will be eligible to earn points that bring you closer to a $7,000 cash prize. Uh, once again, I'd recommend reaching out to your broker advisor for more details. Also, uh, Autopilot exists. Uh, Autopilot is part of our ASP program, and we pushed it a lot last year. Um, that link on the screen, however, to get there is incorrect. It's actually www.crnstone.com uh, slash, uh, I believe it is, well, uh, I'll put it up here in a second. Uh, I can link to it later in the presentation. But uh, for now, that link is incorrect, uh, so please don't write that one down. But uh, you can find out a bit more about it online on our website. And uh, we offer four separate services. We offer a client referral program if a client falls outside of your scope of business, but you still want to make sure that client gets good service for the coverage they're looking for. Uh, we also have succession planning, our parachute program, retirement assistance, and our service agreement as well well. Uh, once you reach out to our uh, broker advisors, they'll be able to help direct you more uh, where to go with what service. And without further ado, let's get started. Um, a lot of the basics of using a computer, like I previously mentioned, are kind of flexible. Uh, there are things that you can use across pretty much all different types of uh, computers. Uh, we're showing my main screen and monitor one now, and I'm just going to go through some of the different areas of a general computer. Uh, almost everything has something like what I'll be covering here today. Uh, first off, let's talk about this bar down here at the bottom, and let me actually change my pen's color to red so it sticks out a little bit more. Um, there we go. Uh, this bar down here is what I'm referring to. Uh, in Windows, that's called the taskbar, uh, but in Mac, that's actually called something else. It's called the dock. Um, the taskbar or dock is basically an area that you can attach different apps to launch them. Uh, you can search here. Uh, you can search the web, or you can search the rest of your computer. Uh, you can also open up our uh, start menus which is right down here. It's the little Windows icon, if you're on Windows. Uh, in Mac, however, it's in a slightly different place. 
and I'm going to go ahead and erase my drawings here and open up a image of a Mac desktop to sort of show you some of the similarities. Here we go. Uh, as you can see, there's a taskbar near the bottom. Uh, the start icon that I mentioned before is right here for Windows. But on Mac, it's actually this little Apple logo up in here. Um, additionally, there's also kind of, uh, you know, desktop icons you can create that sort of fill the desktop. Uh, on this picture of this desktop, there are actually none created right now. Uh, but on Mac, you can also do that as well as on Windows. And if I close out of this image, you can see I have a bunch of these little icons here on my desktop as well. Uh, what these are are shortcuts, and they're just quick ways to launch programs. Uh, you can do that in a number of different ways on a bunch of different types of computers. Uh, but Windows, I think, is pretty straightforward. Uh, there are icons here where I could start up, say, Microsoft Excel just by clicking on it on my desktop. And uh, it started up on my other screen. But as you can see, we now have Excel open. And all I did was double click that with my left uh, cursor. Uh, you could also, however, do the same sorts of things by clicking on these icons here in your taskbar. Uh, I just opened up Firefox, which is a web browser, by scrolling over it and clicking. And I'm going to close it by clicking up here on this red X. Uh, if you hover over most things, it'll tell you information about what they do as well. Uh, for instance, I'm hovering over this red X that says close, which is fairly intuitive. Uh, I could also restore down, which is exiting full screen, and that sort of minimizes the program. If I click the button again, it maximizes it. And I can click this little minus icon here to fully minimize that app, but that doesn't actually close it. What that does is it removes it from your main screen and just sort of keeps it running, but in the background. Uh, I'm going to hover over the icon, and as you can see, it's created a little bit of a tile. Uh, if I click on that tile, it'll open up. I'm going to minimize it again and just click on the logo here instead of that uh, window, and it opens it up again as well. Uh, you can also actually choose which programs are down here. So you're not just stuck to whatever you open up your computer and you see. Um, if I right click on this icon here, which is for, uh, I believe that is Microsoft Edge. Uh, Microsoft Edge is actually one of the built-in Internet Explorer options, or uh, web browsers, I guess, would be the proper term for them. Uh, in Microsoft. Uh, in, I believe it is Safari in Mac OS. Uh, that's kind of their default web browser. Uh, we prefer to use Firefox here, but it's really whatever you'd prefer. Um, if I hit unpin from taskbar, as you can see, it just disappeared. And uh, what that means is it's no longer stored here on my taskbar. You can put pretty much any program you want there as well. Um, but the way you'd go about doing that isn't actually by interacting with this toolbar at all. Uh, the way that I normally do it is I create an icon here on my desktop for the program, and then I right click it. Uh, we'll get into how to create those shortcuts on your desktop here in a moment. But uh, once you right click, that's sort of computer code for show me my options. And that's across pretty much any operating system. Uh, when in doubt, my uh, default option is to right-click and see what shows up. Um, in this case, I right-click, and if I look through these options, I have unpin from start, and then in the second tab, I have pin to taskbar. If I click pin to taskbar, we get that little icon down here in the corner. And I can sort of drag it around and let go to put it wherever I need to in my taskbar as well. Um, in addition to that, 
we also have the ability to link pretty much any program here. And in order to show you how to put any program onto your desktop or taskbar, I'm gonna show you a little bit of the start menu in Windows. Uh, it's rather similar actually to the start window in Mac, but it looks different because it's in a different spot. Um, that little start window will give you a list of different programs on your computer, a quick link to your settings, as well as a few options uh, within your computer's files. Uh, a quick jump to all of your documents, a quick jump to pictures, but you can kind of customize this area as well. Uh, settings is what we'll be clicking on here in a minute to get kind of into the guts of the different customization options of your machine. But as you can see, we have all of our different programs listed here. If I wanted to, uh, let's say, add Publisher to my desktop, all I would do is click and drag uh, from that little start menu to the desktop, and then I'll let go. And that will automatically create a shortcut to Publisher. If I double click on this, I can now open the program known as Publisher. And I could select a document and start from a blank slate. Alternatively, if I wanted to get rid of this shortcut, I right click on it, and then I'm just gonna click delete. And that removes it from my desktop. But if I wanted to do the same thing from the start menu to put it here in my taskbar, I can scroll through, find the um, publisher program, right click on it, go to more, and then hit pin to taskbar. And now I have my little publisher logo right here. If I click on it, it will launch the publisher logo, uh, publisher program. Same thing we just did. I'm going to unpin this from taskbar because I personally don't use it all that much. Um, but uh, that's how you would attach things here. And you can actually customize this taskbar as well. Um, it has uh, icons for uh, little notes over here in the system tray. Uh, this system tray just shows you kind of what's running in the background, not really an open program per se, but other things your computer is doing. Um, the most important icons you'll really need to know about in this part of the taskbar is first the internet uh, logo here. This will help if you say can't access the internet. Uh, if you see a little red X here by this little computer logo in the bottom right, I'm just gonna spotlight it real quick so you see where I am right down in here. Uh, this area is sort of what shows you sort of statuses about your system. So I click on that icon and I can see that I am currently connected to the internet. Um, Alternatively, I can click on the little speaker logo and I can adjust my computer's volume. Uh, you obviously can't hear that, I don't think, but uh, I can adjust how much uh, volume my speakers are putting out using that option. If I click on this little drop down here as well, I can select different audio devices. So that matters if you have a headset and speakers systems that you're using and you're trying to play around with what's, you know, putting out what volume. This is sort of the area you'd go into to do that. You can also click on this little date and time logo here to open up a little calendar. Uh, you can link this with calendar options that are located in Windows 10. Uh, this is kind of a more specific to Windows 10 way to open up your calendar. Uh, in Mac, there is, however, a similar thing you could click on the desktop to get to something similar. And I believe it's down here in your settings, but I'm not 100% uh, great with uh, Macs. Actually, uh, here, let me go ahead and circle it. Uh, right here is your calendar on a Mac. It'll look like a little uh, date pad as well but Mac has the exact same functionality. Uh, additionally, 
you have this little notification icon here. And this is something that's more unique to Windows 10. Um, I believe Windows 11 has a similar setting that can be turned on, but it's not on by default. Uh, Windows 11, if I said Windows 7, sorry. Um, this is called our Notification Center. And if you uh, have Microsoft, um, I believe it's Outlook, uh, your email notices will all come to this area as well. Um, this area is known as the Notification Pane, and it has some basic settings that you can, uh, you know, jump to from here. Uh, all settings jumps us into the full settings menu, uh, which is the Windows settings here. Uh, that'll be the next thing we get into. But um, you also would see any sort of system notifications here. Any sort of email notifications also come here. Uh, anything your system really needs to tell you is going to be done through this notification bar over here. Uh, the next thing we were going to get into is system settings. And actually, you can get into system settings by clicking on all settings here from the notification bar. Or if you click on your Windows or Starter icon, uh, you can click on your settings option from there. I'm going to click on ours right here as a sample. Uh, these Windows settings sort of let you get in-depth and really customize your computer a little bit. Um, we're going to start over here in System because it's probably the most important one and probably the one most people would want to access. Uh, now, there are a ton of options for this, so we're not going to go through 100% of them. Uh, I don't think anyone would have time for that. But uh, what I can do is show you that this is where you would get into kind of your display settings. Uh, if you have multiple screens and sort of want to rearrange where the mouse needs to go to access them, uh, you would rearrange how these are situated here on this screen. Uh, for example, if I'm going to apply this screen setting, um, I actually can't move my cursor to the right in this bottom part of the screen anymore. Um, I can only get to my second screen by sort of scrolling over that information uh, in the upper corner. Uh, it basically tells the computer that my screens are laid out with one in the bottom left and one in the upper right. If I wanted to adjust that back, I could line them up again and hit apply as well. Uh, or I could put one on top of the other directly. Or if I say wanted to say my screen that's currently to my right is actually on my left, I could rearrange these all here. Uh, if you have a problem identifying which one is screen number one and which one is screen number two, uh, then just click identify and it will show you uh, very briefly which screen is which and which icon you're adjusting as well. If you click the identify option here. You can also change different color options. Uh, for instance, night light here, adjust the settings so your screen isn't as bright at nighttime. Uh, or you can adjust some other uh, strength and color balance tips and tricks in here as well. Uh, I like this setting a lot because I tend to be on the computer quite a bit. So it's just another way for my computer to tell me what time it is. That's something that I personally enjoy. Uh, if you have a very high resolution display, you can also adjust some of the color settings here. And you just click it and you can get into some of the more in-depth options. Unfortunately, these screens are not a uh, high definition that I'm using, so I can't adjust them here. But uh, you can adjust all of these high definition color settings from this display section of the uh, computer settings. Uh, you can also change the uh, sort of zoom factor, I guess, is what I'd call it on text. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and up mine to 150 real quick. And I'm not sure that you could see it uh, because we uh, have a separate program here. But I'm going to go ahead and open my actual notes behind here so you can sort of see some of the difference. Um, right now, I'm just going to show you how this text looks on this side of my screen. We're going to go back to 100% scaling. And actually, it's still not quite showing on that screen. That's really irksome. Uh, I'm very sorry. I don't seem to be able to show you that. Oh, duh. Um, make sure you always have the proper screen selected before you change your settings, is what I would recommend. Uh, so I'm going to click on my screen one again here. And then I'm going to change that from 100 to 150 zoom. And as you can see, uh, the zoom on this screen has intensified. If 
I go back to 100, then I can now see everything at just its normal resolution and its normal sort of size. I'm going to move my notes back over here as well. In addition, uh, you can get into more advanced graphical settings if you're uh, interested in doing sort of full resolution photography work from these two options down below as well. And if you have a question about any of these settings, all of these sort of settings zones have different question links. So if you needed more information on setting up multiple monitors, on changing your screen brightness, or on fixing your screen flickering, uh, you could click on these options here. Uh, it's a little bit different for Mac. Uh, they don't exactly have that kind of accessibility, uh, but the trick about Mac is they're actually designed not to have that accessibility. Uh, Macs are kind of supposed to do all of this stuff for you, so uh, you don't actually need to get into these settings if you're using a Mac PC or a Mac computer. Uh, you can also get into your sound settings here as well, uh, other than adjusting things on your slider bar. If you wanted to do things like check your microphone to see if it has any sort of ringing tones or anything else going on with it, uh, then, you know, you might want to go into here and hit the troubleshoot option. Uh, I actually did that before I started this presentation, just to make sure I was sounding appropriate through the microphone. You can also get into the sound control panel here for some more advanced sound settings as well. Uh, because the only speakers I have plugged in are these uh, Panatronics headphones right now, uh, it's actually got everything but the built-in computer speakers disabled as well. Additionally, I can get into the notification center and control exactly what actually pops up there from this section here. Uh, if you are using sort of like a mobile version of Windows 10, you might want to have Cortana pop up. Uh, Cortana is Windows version of Siri. Uh, you can also get into your settings uh, with this option here and turn off settings notification. Uh, you could also turn off your Outlook notices here if you don't like all your Outlook sort of uh, spilling onto your notification bar. Uh, you could turn off autoplay for banners and sounds, uh, security maintenance notifications, and we already mentioned Cortana. There's also Focus Assistant, which is kind of useful if you have trouble kind of focusing in on what you're doing. Uh, it can hide different alarms and uh, control other different notification settings in this section. You can also control your automatic sleep settings from power and sleep. Uh, you can say that if it's turned in with no activity, uh, I want it to go to sleep mode after 10 minutes or after 30 minutes or an hour or however long you'd like your computer to stay awake without any input, you can control from this power and sleep section. That's really the most uh, in-depth thing that you would ever really need here. Uh, you can also access your storage settings, which we're going to be getting more in-depth into uh, here as our last topic. Um, but basically, you can see all of what's sort of taking up your storage space on your computer from this section. Uh, it'll only show you any physical disk that's plugged in to your computer, however. Uh, if you have other sort of networked uh, drives, and uh, you probably won't know what that is unless you have it set up, uh, then you won't be able to see that from the section here. Uh, there's also tablet mode if you're using Windows on a tablet, uh, different multitasking options and uh, projection options, as well as shared experiences. And these are kind of more in-depth options into Windows 10 that I don't think our basic user really needs to know about. Uh, the only other section in this sort of home setting uh, that I would see or uh, say you might want to know about is the remote desktop. And that's just because everyone's working from home. Uh, if you click on remote desktop, uh, most of these, if you are part of a larger organization, will be shut down. Um, but this is sort of the area you'd go into in order to set that up. I wouldn't recommend setting up remote desktop unless you're a little more experienced with how to. Uh, but if you have a guide or you have someone sort of instructing you about how to do it, this is the area that you would go to. Uh, I'm going to hit back and go into the general Windows settings now. Uh, we were just covering system settings here, but if you need to set up a printer or a mouse or some sort of wireless keyboard and you're having any issues other than just plugging it into your USB port, uh, I'm going to go ahead and click it and this is where you would go to at that device. Uh, if you go to Bluetooth, 
and hit add Bluetooth or other device. This is where you would add any sort of wireless display or uh, wireless printer that's using Bluetooth. Uh, keyboard and mice are also really common devices. You just click on the Bluetooth option, select it when it comes up, and uh, that's how you would connect that device. Uh, you can also add like plug-in printers uh, or wireless printers from the printers and scanners section. Shockingly, uh, if you hit the plus button, it'll actually scan for a bunch of different printers uh, that are connected to the device that it could possibly access. I'm not going to click on these options any further here because that kind of gets into our network infrastructure. Um, but all you would have to do is find the printer that you have that's available from printers and scanners, click on it, and you can access any sort of setting for that printer and setup that you would need to from this section. You can also uh, change mouse sensitivity from this device setting by clicking on mouse. And then you can choose how many lines you're scrolling at a time with your mouse. I'm going to leave my at the default here. But if you think your mouse is kind of scrolling too slowly, uh, this is where you would be able to sort of increase the uh, speed that you're scrolling with uh, through many different lines. Uh, you can also uh, have scrolling inactive windows when you hover over them. That's a setting that I personally use a lot because I have a ton of Excel documents open a lot of the time. Uh, but basically, when you have that little pop-up window and you scroll through with your middle bar here, uh, you can jump through all sorts of different windows to open them up. Uh, that's what that scroll over windows is. You can also change some typing settings from this typing menu here as well. Uh, you can autocorrect, uh, highlight misspelled words, uh, and change all of those sort of uh, text settings here. If you don't like it to highlight words uh, when you have a misspell, you can just click a button to turn it off. Or you can leave it on like I do because I'm terrible at spelling. Uh, you can also turn it off uh, autocorrect here as well. Uh, you can have typing suggestions show when you're typing in kind of text recognition software, uh, or you can turn that function off. It's more useful for tablets than it is for actual physical computers. Um, you can also add space after you choose a text suggestion. Uh, that option is on here. I always actually like to turn that option off because I don't like space getting added in when I highlight things. Uh, and also, you can automatically add a period if you double tap the space bar. And this is actually an option that I recommend leaving on, especially if you used to type a lot on different types of um, physical keyboards, uh, more like uh, typewriters. Um, back then, it was very frequent to just have double spaces uh, in between pretty much everything. Um, if you type like that now, it's still definitely totally something you can do. Um, and it's definitely something that people who uh, are kind of older kind of like to see. Uh, it's something they're used to. Um, a lot of younger people don't actually do that. And uh, I know the first time that I saw that, I thought it was kind of weird type spacing. Um, but if you have that on, whenever you try to double tap at the end of a sentence, it'll automatically just add in a period and you can move on. It also actually speeds up your typing speed. So it's something that I would actually like to get used to doing, my, uh, doing myself. So I think that's a pretty cool option. Uh, you can also use sort of on-screen keyboards as well here with the uh, hardware keyboard. Uh, it adds text suggestions when you're typing on a physical keyboard. Um, that's an option. I'm not going to turn it on here, but it's an option that you can have. Uh, you can also access sort of signature options with pen and ink here if you're kind of signing things on a physical tablet as well as change the options for how it interacts with USB devices when you plug them in. Uh, for instance, right here I have a USB, and I still see the little check mark here, notify me if there are any issues connecting USBs. And I'm going to go ahead and plug this one in to get into kind of the final thing we're going to be covering today, which is the File Explorer in Windows. Uh, this is also called Finder in Mac. Um, but as you can see, I plugged in that USB device. I got a little notification that I had something plugged in if you didn't hear the bum ba da dum sound. Uh, and then it uh, automatically opened up this USB drivey from that little notification that I put in. I'm going to exit out of this. Uh, 
and just real quick show you how to remove devices like this safely. Uh, I always recommend doing this uh, if you're going to plug in and store information on a USB because you might have something open on the USB drive before you unplug it that you didn't realize. And if you have a program or a picture even that's open from a USB and you just pull it from a piece of hardware, uh, then it can actually corrupt the files that are on there and you could lose documents. So I always recommend just uh, safely removing USB drives. And the way you do that is first you close out everything that you think has it open. Uh, then you can go into your system tray, which is this little carrot icon, or if you see an icon that looks like this, a little USB drive with a check mark, uh, that's the Windows logo for safely removing. And I'm going to hit eject disk. Now it gives me that little notification that it's safe to remove that, and I can unplug it from my computer. If I plug it back in, I automatically open that USB drive as well. If I uh, then wanted to put files on here, I can actually do that pretty easily. Um, the way that you interact with files here is very straightforward. Uh, I'm going to open up a, another file explorer here. Uh, it's going to be right over here. And this actually has a bunch of pictures, my notes, and the uh, PowerPoint that I used for this presentation here as well. Um, in order to transfer files back and forth between this folder that I have open and this USB drive, all I've got to do is select what I want, this Mac desktop, for example, drag it over to the new window, and let go. And when I do that, I now have a copy of this file over here. I'm going to go ahead and open it just to show you that I do have this little picture of a Mac desktop uh, right here. And then I'm going to close out of it. Uh, that's how you would transfer pictures, uh, you know, Word documents, any sort of file uh, that you need to move back and forth between your computer and your flash drive. It's just drag and drop. I'm going to go ahead and close out of the USB drive and actually talk a little more about how you can interact with this file explorer here because it's pretty universal. Uh, Finder on Macs is exactly the same thing and it actually looks like this. Uh, as you can see, you've got kind of this toolbar on the left as well as sort of blank space here in the middle. Um, that blank space over here in the middle is the same thing as where all of these files are here in this sort of file explorer. And uh, that's where you would find them. I'm going to go ahead and click on local disk C over here on the left. And what that is, is my local hard drive. Uh, this left hand side here kind of shows quick access to a bunch of commonly accessed folders, as well as all the different areas of your computer to store media. Uh, you can store things on your desktop, which is this big background center area here. Uh, you can store things on a USB drive, which is what I have plugged in, or you could store it on any other drive that's connected networked into the computer. That's what our little uh, drives down here look like with the little uh, green icon at the bottom. Uh, I'm not going to click on those because that kind of gets into some of our personal information here at Cornerstone, but this is how you would tell what, you know, is physically attached to the computer or these little drive options. Uh, local disk C is actually the base hard drive that has Windows installed on it. If you wanted to get into any sort of more in-depth information about what's stored on your computer, you can go to users, click on whatever user account you have. For me, it's T. Levine. And then I have a file explorer demo file that I have set up here. Um, you could click on that to access any sort of files that are stored here physically on local disk C under you as a user. Uh, this is where pretty much everything you can build and save happens. Uh, your downloads, where you download files from the internet, go into downloads. Uh, by default, documents are saved to documents, although you can control what gets saved there. Uh, your desktop is here. And that actually shows you all of the physical files that are saved on the desktop. 
and then favorites, which are things you click on frequently or uh, different sort of favorited options through internet browsers are stored here. Uh, you also have your File Explorer demo, which I'm gonna get into in a little bit more in depth now. Uh, the File Explorer is pretty much how you can pull up any sort of saved file you have. Uh, for instance, if I had an Excel file under one of these folders, in order to get there, I would open up my File Explorer, which I can do by either clicking on the little file icon here in my taskbar, or by hitting Start and just typing F-I-L-E for File, and my File Explorer comes up. Uh, once I click on that, I'm going to go back through that tree to C, Users, Tom Levine, File Explorer Demo, and then I'm going to just click on one of the options. As you can see, I can get into more in-depth kind of folders here. Uh, this is how I personally like to organize all of my documents. Um, I know a lot of people will just download things from the internet, throw them onto their desktop, and work purely off of that. And quite frankly, that's a fine way to work temporarily. Um, the problem with just throwing literally everything onto the desktop is it gets a little cluttered and a little disorganized. Uh, if I had icons on this screen, sort of covering every inch of this desktop, I personally wouldn't be able to see anything or search any of my files or do anything to really get at what's stored where on this desktop. I don't think it's a good way to search. Uh, that's what File Explorer really gives you as an advantage. Uh, for instance, if I click on desktop in my File Explorer, and let's say I'm trying to search for this GoToMeeting, and I had a bunch of different things saved here. I can click on the search in the upper right-hand corner uh, on Max. It's actually in the exact same spot. It's right here, the search bar. And then I'm just going to type go to and then I'm going to hit this little blue icon and it'll search. And it brings up any file that matches go to under that hierarchy. Uh, what I mean by that is anything stored under my desktop that had the words go to in it would have popped up here. And to clear this search, I'm just gonna hit this little X icon here. And that will clear it out of your search. And then you can search for something else like EXEL for Excel and I hit enter on my keyboard that time to do the search. Nothing matched. Uh, that's not something that you can do just natively from this desktop here. So that's kind of why I prefer to kind of store everything in my file system. Now I'm gonna go back to that test folder, uh, which was stored under our local drives and me as a user. And I'm gonna kind of get more in depth into what I meant with that search function because it's actually pretty powerful. If I open up Carrier here, I see that I have a bunch of different folders. I have Aetna, Altrua, Anthem, Molina, and Oscar. If I open up Aetna, I have clients, commission documents, quotes, and scripts. If I open up clients, that folder is empty. But if I go into my File Explorer demo folder and just search clients, and then my search, it'll pull up a folder called clients. If I right click on it, I then get access to a bunch of other options. And one of the options that I wanted to highlight here, other than open, which is at the top, or open a new window even, uh, what I wanted to highlight is this option down here, which is open folder location. Uh, if you click on that, then it'll actually open up to where that file is saved in your folders. Uh, as you can see by this upper area here, uh, this bar kind of tells me where in my file tree I am. And what that means is it's telling me where under my file explorer I'm currently browsing documents or looking at things, to put it in a bit more plain English. Um, and the search for clients led me to this clients folder. Even though there's nothing under it, I was able to search and find it because I was searching for a file that was higher up in that hierarchy, right under here, this file explorer demo. Um, if I were searching for it here under Aetna, so I'm just gonna type file explorer demo, and hit the go button, 
what I'm getting here is anything that kind of triggered the search for file explorer demo under that Aetna folder that I was already under. If I go up like that, I can go up to see other search results. Um, it's not very helpful if you're actually searching, but if I hit back, then it'll actually take me back through where I just was in my folder browsing. Forward takes me forward as well. And that's kind of the way that I would recommend getting away from storing everything to your desktop. Um, it's just something that I think is really useful, especially for getting into computers. Uh, the other reason that I tell people not to save things to their desktop that often is because it actually does slow down your computer. Um, this desktop file here um, is kind of integrated into the base kind of core functions of your computer. And the more things you throw on here, uh, the more things it'll automatically search through first before pulling up documents, before running programs, before doing things. Uh, so it can really slow down your computer if you save things here. Uh, that's also why I recommend people have a external hard drive or a USB drive to back up files as well. Um, it's better if you save things not on the same hard drive that you have everything installed on, but that's also more of an advanced kind of use. Uh, the only other thing I'd mention about using a bunch of different operating systems and operating a computer in general is that this little area called the recycle bin exists on pretty much everything. Uh, it's where your documents go when you delete them. And if I open this up, as you can see, our publisher icon from earlier is actually here in this recycle bin. Uh, for Mac computers, I'm gonna go ahead and open up the image of our desktop again. Here we go. It's actually going to be this trash can right over here in the bottom corner. And I'm going to circle it right here as well. Uh, what that area is, is actually where all of your files that you delete are temporarily stored. Now, what that means is if I wanted to restore this desktop shortcut, I would right click on it. Again, right click gives you all your options. And on PC, it's gonna be restore. Uh, on Mac, I believe it's uh, send back or uh, go back or something like that. Um, but if you click on it, then it'll actually put that uh, link right back where it was. For me, it's this publisher icon. If I wanna delete something from my desktop, I just right click and hit delete, and it automatically sends it to the recycle bin. If I really 100% know that I don't want to access that file, don't ever want anyone to be able to pull it up again, I right click on my recycle bin and hit empty recycle bin. It'll give me a little notice. Are you sure you want to permanently delete this file? I click yes and it deletes that file. Uh, it's the exact same thing as how you accessed, uh, or the exact same sort of uh, way that you would fully delete an item. Um, if you don't delete things that way, it won't actually change. Um, one last thing of note as well, uh, if you're ever interested in kind of customizing your desktop a little bit more, changing your backgrounds, uh, you can find any image. Uh, this could be on the internet or this could be here, you know, stored locally. Right click on it and then you'd click set as desktop background. And as you can see, that changed my desktop background to this new picture. And if you click on settings and go into personalization, you can also change things like the colors of the different windows that are popping up. Uh, it has these dark and light mode options for going through things quickly. Or I could change colors automatically just by double clicking on them. Uh, that changed my accent color to red. And uh, that means my start menu and all of these icons are now red. I personally don't really enjoy that, so I'm gonna change it back to gray by double clicking on this gray color here. It just takes a second for it to load up. But that's kind of how you would go about customizing your computer.
Uh, you can change a few other options that I haven't covered on here, um, but that kind of is generally the best way that I would recommend using it. Um, if you have any other questions, please feel free to uh, put them in the question box, and I will go ahead and answer your questions now. Uh, thank you for being so attentive throughout this presentation. Uh, just two other notes before I get more in-depth into answering your questions. Uh, for signing up more for those ASP programs, you can go to www.crnstone.com, which is what I'm putting up here in my uh, web browser, Firefox. And then you can go under what we offer, Agency Services Program. And that will lead you to more information about that Agency Services Program we talked about before. And uh, lastly, as well, uh, if you would like to contact me with additional questions or information, you can do that as well uh, by reaching out to me at tlevine at crnstone.com or calling me at 513-487-5390. Uh, now, uh, into some of these questions that we've got. Uh, the first one we've got is actually from uh, Kathy, and it's, should we update to 11 yet? I'm, uh, I believe that's referring to Windows 11, which we mentioned a little earlier. Um, you know, my jury uh, or my decision on Windows 11 is kind of still out. Um, Windows 10 was actually intended originally by Microsoft to be the very last of the operating systems that they were going to release. Uh, everyone was just going to have to buy Windows 10 and it would get upgraded over time. Uh, that being said, Microsoft likes money and likes to develop things, and computers changed as well, so we now have Windows 11. If your computer is giving you the option to update to Windows 11 for free, uh, then I'd go ahead and do it. Uh, it operates a little more similarly to how a Mac would operate, so if you're not used to Macintosh systems, then I'd recommend holding off and uh, maybe letting them flush it out a little bit more first. Um, everything operates very similarly as it does to in Windows, so don't let that be like the biggest hold up. Um, but personally, I haven't even switched over to Windows 11. Um, also, a lot of older computers don't actually have the hardware to support Windows 11. Uh, if you have a computer from prior to 2019, it's a pretty good bet that you're not going to be able to get the most out of Windows 11, and you should probably stay with Windows 10. So I know that's kind of more of a complex answer than you were probably looking for, Kathy. But um, I guess boiled down, my recommendation is, if you have a completely new computer from this year, or uh, even 2021 or 2020, then you might want to consider updating to Windows 11. Uh, if you have a computer from prior to that, maybe as old as 2019, 2018, or even further back, you definitely don't want to use Windows 11. Uh, it'll slow down your system, and it's, it's probably not for you. Um, we also have another uh, question here from Jules, uh, which is, how do you stop files from being added to the quick access, and can you control this? Uh, the answer to that question is actually yes, and I'm going to show you how to do that right now. Um, let me know if you're referring to a different quick action or quick access, but I think you're referring to this area up here in the File Explorer, which is this quick access toolbar. Um, quick access is something that's sort of built into File Explorer, so it's not like you can necessarily completely disable it, but what you can do is control things that are displayed here. Uh, if I right click on this documents area under quick access, uh, then I can look through the different options. It has pin to start, uh, include in library, give access to, um, all of these different options down here, but the one we're looking for is actually the second one down, which is unpin from quick access. I'm going to click on it, and then it's unpinned there. Uh, alternatively, for regular things uh, that are just kind of shown up here, I'm going to right click on it, and I'm going to click remove from quick access. And that removes that folder from quick access. Uh, this quick access here is actually populated and determined by the things you click on most. So it's supposed to be a time-saving feature, um, but that's how you would remove different items that are from quick access. Alternatively, you can click on this little arrow key if you don't want things showing up there. And when I close out of this file browser and reopen it, 
now my quick access is minimized. So that's probably the better option for you is to just keep it minimized. Don't even bother looking at it. That's my recommendation. Uh, and we actually do have another question here from Barbara, which is a little in depth, but honestly, probably one of the most in-depth questions I've ever gotten on a Tech Tuesday. Uh, I really like that one, Barbara, thank you. It's how long to keep old files on a USB? Uh, do they ever degrade? Uh, do I need to store it in a dry place or is humidity needed? And that's a great question, Barbara, really it is. Um, I've had a lot of you know, personal gripes with that myself. Um, a lot of USBs, and actually I'll remove this one to kind of show you and talk about it in a little bit more detail here. Um, but a lot of USBs kind of look like this. Uh, they're small little cases. They come with a cap right here for this little top section. And once I uh, cap it off there, uh, then the files that I put on this will stay on this for as long as the actual memory chip on this device will last. Now, I've seen USB drives from 2000 that still work perfectly fine. And it's possible that drives will always work perfectly fine if you just plug them in, back things up to there, and just leave it be. Uh, my recommendation is to store them in a dry place. Humidity isn't actually necessary, and it's not something that would necessarily hurt your USB drive unless you dunk it in like a jug of water. Um, but you actually can store it in, you know, humid conditions, dry conditions. I personally prefer dry conditions. Um, the way these things actually work is they are chips kind of soldered on the silica. So what that means is it's melted metal that's kind of bonded to essentially sand or glass. Um, the best way to store those is always going to be in a more dry condition. But more often than not, as long as you have a cap for that uh, top bit here, just throw it into your first drawer on your desk. It should be fine. Uh, so long as it doesn't you know, get snapped in half or get broken entirely, I think you'll probably be okay. Um, there are a bunch of different types of drives and methods of storing things. USB drives are a type of solid state drive. And uh, what solid state drives do is they store information as sort of magnetic information. Uh, the magnetic charge on a magnet is a one or a zero, and that's how they're stored. Um, USB files stored like this last, you know, a very, very long time. And you don't have to worry about file degradation really for most practical uses. But maybe once every 10 years is when I'd buy a new one. Just move things over to make sure you've got a usable disk. Um, but, you know, that's just as often as I would replace it. And if you've got anything that's worth like a lot of memory, uh, if you have something up to like maybe a terabyte as an external hard drive, which is um, the amount of memory that's stored on your USB drive, I'd recommend probably swapping that out every, you know, 20 years maybe then. Um, but really, it's not a concern you have to really have, so long as you don't dunk it in something like water or uh, break your actual physical USB thing in half, then your data is probably not recoverable. So I would just store it in your desk. You're probably fine, uh, unless you're on a boat. Then you might want to you know, make sure it's kind of in like a, a dry Ziploc bag or something like that to keep water off. And uh, no problem, Barbara. So it's kind of getting to the end of our time here as well. Uh, if you have any other questions, please feel free to uh, put it there in the questions area. Uh, otherwise, I hope you've had a wonderful Tuesday and have a great rest of your day. Thank you.